Hello everyone, Helen here. We're in the camper van again. <laughs> yep, I'm going to take you on another trip. Uh, so well, welcome back if you've been here lots of times before and you know what to expect. If it's your first time, well, this is my little creative space on YouTube, my, my little podcast here, and I just like to share most of the time the, all the creative things I love to do, but I also take you off in the camper van. It's almost a year now as I record this, that uh, Phil, my husband and I, bought this camper van. And we've been off on all kinds of trips so far, all in the UK so far, but um, yeah, I'll take you on another trip today. And this trip actually was just a couple of weeks after the previous one that I took you on, but this time instead of, um, instead of traveling north, we were traveling south. And the main reason for wanting to go on this particular trip was that I really, really wanted to go to the yarn festival called Wonderwall Wales. Uh, but we decided as it was quite a long way, we would make a longer trip of it. And we had a fantastic time. And in fact, uh, I seem to have so much to tell you about it that I've decided to break it into two parts. Uh, so yeah, part one this week and I'll return again next week with part two with the rest of the trip. So I hope you're going to enjoy coming along with us. And we'll begin with a map to show you where we were going. So we began in Durham and we had to head south towards Wales. Uh, the distance from Durham to the middle of Wales is about 260 miles, uh, which is about 430 kilometres. And we actually set off on the Thursday evening mainly so that we could at least be on our way rather than just faffing about for ages in the morning which we have a tendency to do. So we only drove for an hour or so uh, as the sun was setting and we headed for the moorland of the North Pennines where we found a lovely spot for the night on a fairly lumpy parking area in a little dip. Um, it sheltered us a bit from the strong winds that were gusting around us but the wind did continue to gently rock the van all through the night. It was quite nice though. <laughs> we were very cosy and we loved waking up on the wild moors where there was absolutely no one else to be seen for miles around. So on the Friday morning we managed to get away earlier than we usually usually do in the camper van in the mornings. Often we're not ready to set off until about 9.30 or so. But this time we managed to get away at quarter past eight, which is quite a record. <laughs> and we drove over the moors and some beautiful countryside with some panoramic views and then back onto the main roads. Soon after driving through the lovely little town of Kirby Stephen, we joined the M6 motorway and we drove for many miles southwards on this road. Lovely scenery to begin with. It is very nice at the northern end of the motorway, but it is rather a busy motorway once you start approaching the Manchester area and I really, really don't enjoy being on motorways. Eventually, though, we came off the motorway and it wasn't too long before we crossed the border from England into Wales and we were driving along some much pleasanter country roads. You can see here on the map where we were, aiming for the town of Llangollen in North Wales. Uh, it was lunchtime by the time we arrived and after parking the van we had a lovely wander around the town. The lunch we had in this cafe was, I would say, rather average, but the reward for eating there was that there was a huge second-hand bookshop upstairs, which of course it would have been rude to ignore. We then ogled the oggies in the oggy shop. <laughs> Oggies are pasties, which is pastry enclosing a mixture of meat and vegetables and other things, uh, all of which looked very inviting, although we'd also been recommended the scotch eggs and we chose a couple of those for later. Llangothlin is an extremely picturesque town that's been popular with tourists since Victorian times. There's been a stone bridge over the River Dee in Llangothlin since the 13th century although the current bridge dates to 1656 and is included in the Seven Wonders of Wales. <laughs> but apologies, I didn't really get a proper picture of the bridge. Uh, the town thrived on the wood, woolen industry, the cotton industry and quarrying slate and a few other things as well. 
The fast-flowing River Dee enabled the working of many mills, including fulling mills for treating the wool that was made into cloth and blankets. There was a corn mill here until the end of the 19th century. It was originally built in the 13th century by monks of a nearby abbey. Uh, and you might be interested, if you don't already know, that most signs in Wales are written in both English and Welsh, as you can see here on the corn mill sign. I also came across a very interesting sign somewhere else in the town, which with no Welsh on it actually, which caught my attention, which I think is very intriguing. <laughs> Langotland's original railway line came to the town in 1861, but in the late 1960s it fell into disuse and all of the tracks were removed and a lot of the stations and things. However, a group of enthusiastic people got together in 1974 to restore the railway as a heritage railway and visitor attraction, and since then 10 miles of track have been relayed along the old track bed. The railway takes you through the beautiful Dee Valley from Llangollen to Corwen. Uh, we had a lovely wander around the station which still survives from Victorian times and which has been painted in the colours of the Great Western Railway of the 1950s. We enjoyed the feeling of going back in time with the old ticket office and the piles of luggage and seeing the old travel posters. It's really, really nice. After that, we drove a little way out of the town and went for a walk by the canal. Now, the building of the Llangollen Canal, and which is an offshoot of the Shropshire Union Canal in 1805, enabled goods such as slate and wool to be transported to England and beyond. We'd gone mainly to see the Horseshoe Falls, a weir that was designed by engineer Thomas Telford in 1806 to supply water to the Shropshire Union Canal because the canal was taking too much water from the River Dee and that was causing problems for the mill owners. Nearby we stopped to see the chain bridge, which is the oldest existing chain bridge in the world. It was first built in 1817 by a local entrepreneur with the lovely name of Experius Pickering. He objected to paying the tolls to get across the main bridge over the river in Llangollen when he wanted to export coal and lime and iron bars to England. So his solution was to build his own bridge using iron chain links to support the crossing. It lasted 60 years and each time the bridge was rebuilt, the original iron chains were used. The bridge is a link between the village of Llanticilio and Berwyn railway station and in the First World War, the soldiers leaving the village to go off to war would cross this bridge to get to the station, uh, some sadly never to return. We drove off after our walk, and interestingly, on a road bridge that went underneath the railway bridge, and we went to visit a World Heritage Site, the Ponkasilty Aqueduct, which takes the Langochlan Canal across the Dee Valley. Ponkasilty literally translates as the bridge that connects, although it quickly acquired the nickname of the stream in the sky because of the breathtaking height at which it crossed the river, 126 feet below, or that's about 38 metres. The canal aqueduct itself is a trough made of thin sheets of metal uh, because the structure had to be as lightweight as possible and it's supported by 18 stone piers which become hollow as they rise. It was designed by engineers Thomas Telford and William Jessop and it was opened in 1805 where there was a procession of boats to the accompaniment of music and gunfire. It must have been quite a daring feat to cross for the first time. And Phil and I have actually been uh, across the aqueduct when we had a week's narrowboat holiday or oh, nearly uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> It was rather a scary experience, I have to say, especially as our daughter was a toddler at the time and I had to cling on to her very securely as we crossed over. I didn't actually have the courage to walk all the way across on this visit, but Phil did and he got some lovely photos of the shadow of the aqueduct on the valley below. We did another little walk to get a view of the whole aqueduct. It certainly looked very majestic through the trees and it really is an incredible feat of engineering, thoroughly deserving of its world heritage status. By this time the sun was starting to set, so we had something to eat back in the van, 
including the speciality Scotch eggs, which we'd bought earlier in the day at the Llangollen Oggy shop. Uh, we drove away from the towns and villages then and found a very beautiful spot for the night overlooking the Dee Valley. Well, how lovely it was to wake up in this beautiful location. At first there was a mist in the valley, but the sun soon broke through and stayed with us all day. We had a great view of this part of the valley, um, and we never tire of being in places like this. After breakfast we set off, and heading once again for Llangollen, which was much busier than the previous day, mainly because it was now Saturday. Uh, we were early enough to find a parking spot though, and we then walked up the hill out of the town to visit a historic house and gardens called Plas Newith. This had been the home of two infamous ladies, the ladies of Llangollen, Lady Eleanor Butler and Miss Sarah Ponsonby. Living in Ireland, their families were pressurising them into following mm, a conventional lifestyle that they did not want to follow. They wanted to live together as a couple and they had one failed attempt to escape from Ireland in 1778 when they were dressed up as men um, but then were discovered. But a couple of years later they successfully arrived in Wales and they decided to settle in Llangollen. Their home here was originally just a standard stone cottage, nothing special about it. But over the years, they made all sorts of alterations and additions. From about 1798, they began to gothicise the house, adding all sorts of oak carvings. Any visitors that the ladies had were asked to come bearing anything that had been carved from oak, such as chairs and tables and beds and even church fittings. Apparently it was a time when many churches were being upgraded and remodelled and this was all then fitted to the house in the manner of a jigsaw. After lunch in the tea room at Plas Newith, we walked back into Llangollen and headed to the railway station, where we'd hoped to go on a train ride on the Heritage Railway. But we hadn't made an advance booking and the train we wanted to go on was full. So for plan B, we climbed another hill up to the Llangollen Canal Wharf and decided to go on a horse-drawn canal trip, which turned out to be an excellent decision. I was surprised to learn that the Llangollen Wharf Pleasure Boat Company had been offering boat trips since 1884, which was a time when most businessmen turned away from transporting things on the canal and using the railway instead. The Canal Wharf is a lovely place to spend time. It's got a real oldie worldy ambience, and that's partly down to all of the canal art around the wharf. All sorts of lovely pictures there. And while we were waiting for our boat trip to leave, we had a lovely stroll along the canal and just appreciated the still water and the wildlife and the beautiful reflections of trees. Oh, 
it was really nice. And we also had an excellent view down to the town. We also said hello to the gorgeous Shire horses who work hard pulling the canal boats along, just in the way that used to happen before canal boats had engines. The Shire horses just live here through the summer months and then they are taken off to fields to have a nice time through the winter. <laughs> um, very soon we were able to board our boat, the William Jessup, one of the engineers who worked on the design of the original canal. And our horse, whose name was Dakota, was attached to the boat with a rope and we began to glide silently along the canal. It was an incredibly calm and peaceful experience with just the gentle sounds of lapping water and the clip-clopping of horse hooves as accompaniment. We were at the back of the boat on the outward journey, so I got some better photos of the horse on the way back, but you can just see the horse quietly being guided along the towpath, not too troubled by all the people who were also enjoying the, the lovely sunny weather walking along the towpath. We reached the halfway point of the trip, and while the horse rested and had a well-deserved bite to eat, I paused for a while to appreciate what a fine horse he was. Um, we stretched our legs and visited the train bridge again that we'd visited on the previous day. And we enjoyed watching a few active people enjoying their time on the river, going down the rapids in canoes and other less usual modes of transport, all of which looked much less sedate than a gentle canal boat. Very soon we were embarking on our return journey. Back at the van we were soon on the road again, heading for somewhere to stop to eat our tea. We paused in a lovely little village called Montgomery and shared the giant lamb and mint oggy that we'd bought earlier from the Llangochlan oggy shop and we then went off in search of an overnight spot. When you're choosing to stop in places other than campsites you have to accept that they're not always going to be in stunning locations and this was the case for our third night was a little car park off a main road with a disused toilet block and a row of port -a So not the most salubrious place we've stopped in, although I have to say the port -a were clean and usable, so I didn't complain about that. We had a peaceful night there with little traffic noise from the main road in fact, and I woke to feelings of great excitement because it was the day that I was going to Wonderwall, Wales. We had about an hour's drive to get to the Royal Welsh Showground in both wells, you can see here on the map, and Phil dropped me off at about quarter to ten, uh, which gave me just a little time to wait before the yarn show opened. I really had a superb time at Wonderwall, and if you haven't seen it yet, I'll put a link to my special Wonderwall podcast at the end of this one. Uh, Phil, meanwhile, drove a little further south to the mountain area called the Brecon Beacons National Park, and which has 
recently been renamed Banai Brichenyog and he went for a walk up Penny Fan and had a great day despite the occasional heavy rain showers and he took some excellent photos of the landscape around Penny Fan. So Phil came and collected me from Wonderwall uh, not long after it finished and we then got on our way again. We had about an hour's drive. Uh, we were driving uh, to a place near Ludlow in Shropshire. Uh, we were going to visit my auntie and you can see here on the map roughly where it is that we were going. But I am going to finish uh, this trip there today. And uh, as I said at the start, I'm going to um, take you on the rest of the trip next time. So, yeah, I will just say goodbye to you now. Uh, have a lovely, creative, not too busy week and take good care of yourself. And I will see you again very soon. OK, then. Bye.